Good morning. And Jim, let me turn this over to you to introduce the SWAN program today. Okay, thank you very much, Bev. And first of all, I really would like to thank you, Bev, for all your work to help host this event, all the underlying logistics, the advertising of the event. Very, very much appreciate this partnership we have between SWAN, which is the Southwest Agroforestry Action Network, and the Arizona Community uh, Tree Council, which Bev is the executive director of. Without that support, um, we would have a very difficult time putting on these webinars. So I'm Jim Allen. Um, I'm a professor and the executive director in the School of Forestry at Northern Arizona University. And I am also the current chair of SWAN, the Southwest Agroforestry Action Network. Uh, this group began in uh, late 2017, so it's still a relatively new, small, all-volunteer group. But we are growing. We have over 80 members now on our on our mailing list, and uh, we've been trying to build the level of activity and the level of services we provide. So it wasn't too long ago we started this webinar series. This is the third that we have offered in this series, and. We hope it's a really good service to folks like you in the audience here. I hope you'll appreciate and enjoy and learn from this. Just, just very briefly, let me say a couple words about what our purpose is. What, what, what is SWAN all about? We really have three pretty straightforward purposes. And one is to share information and, con and connect potential collaborators and partners interested in agroforestry. And that, that's one of the things we hope we're doing with this webinar series. We're certainly trying to share information, but we hope it goes beyond that to connecting potential collaborators and partners. We want to generate ideas, research, and initiatives. And again, webinars like this may help with that. And ultimately, what we're all about is increasing adoption of agroforestry practices of different types in the Southwest. That, that really is the ultimate goal. So, we're excited to be offering these kinds of uh, events and we would have offered our first large in-person conference except for the whole COVID crisis. Um, we've been talking about when we're gonna be able to offer that, probably not until 2022. Uh, I would encourage you if you're interested in being involved in this organization to stay after this webinar uh, for the business meeting that we'll have where we'll be discussing things like um, upcoming conferences and other activities we can get involved in. So I, I'm going to at this point turn it over to Stephen Price. Steve, Stephen is an extension uh, assistant professor at Utah State University. He serves Carbon County based in Price, um, Utah, and he is a fellow member of the executive committee of this group. And Steve knows the, um, the speakers better than I do. And so he is going to introduce the two speakers. So Steve. Thanks, Jim. Um, so today we have um, Reagan White Slusi with, um, who is with Utah State University Extension. Um, she's an assistant professor of agriculture, natural resources and 4-H in San Juan County. For those unfamiliar with Utah geography, San Juan County is basically the entire southeast corner of the state. Um, a lot of country to cover. Um, so Reagan completed her master's degree uh, last summer where she was studying underutilized um, traditional Native American food crops such as Southwest peach and Navajo spinach. Um, so Rocky Mountain bee plant. Um, both of these are, are very important food crops to the Navajo, uh, Hopi, and Zuni nations. Um, she's continued to, to work um, on some of this research and also um, beginning looking for partners to look at pinion pine seed production. So um, nut production for edible crops um, in kind of our marginal areas of Utah. So um, for those that have an interest in this, definitely uh, contact them. Also today we have Dr. Yuping Sun, um, who is an assistant professor in landscape horticulture in the plant soils and climate department at Utah State University. 
Um, prior to coming to USU, he researched um, California corn lily production at Clemson and um, plant stress physiology of uh, many different landscape plants and agricultural crops while he was at Texas A&M. Um, and currently he's working on whole plant uh, stress, water stress responses and utilizing some of our different native plants for um, water efficient landscape use. And he's also working with Regan on the pinion production, um, pinion production project uh, going on here in Utah, a few different areas of Utah. So um, yeah, I'll turn it over to them and uh, thanks for having us or thanks for joining us. Thank you, Stephen. So I'll go ahead and um, share my screen. Um, I just wanted to add to um, what Stephen has, has uh, discussed for us. Um, Dr. Yoping's son, um, and he'll, he'll explain it a little bit more, but he actually took up a majority of the pinion work after Dr. Larry Rupp, um, who's now retired from Utah State University, initiated a lot of the, the program. Um, today, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about some of my uh, research with the peaches as it is a woody crop um, that has been uh, produced by Native Americans in the Southwest for hundreds of years. Um, and then um, and then I'll hand it off to Dr. Sun to discuss the opinion research that we are collaborating um, together on. So um, I grew up in Gallup, New Mexico. So if anybody here is from New Mexico area, um, welcome. And um, I am half uh, half Navajo. Uh, hinder the um, the research that I founded my master's on. Let's see. Excuse me while I get into the showing screen. Okay, so um, there's my contact information below. I, I can go back to that at the end of my presentation if needed. Um, but we have a couple of woody food crops um, that are uh, potentially ideal for southwestern agroforestation practices. Um, since this is a new group, uh, we wanted to contribute to introducing ideas that may be of interest. So oftentimes, um, it is thought of uh, traditional food crops for Native Americans to be the corn beans and squash. Um, we also had a lot of uh, wild perennials that were gathered during, um, during seed harvest or um, vegetative harvest for, for medicines or for food use. Um, but the one that I'm going to talk to you about is uh, the Southwest peach today. And then, um, as I said, uh, Dr. Yoping's son will begin talking with you uh, for, for pine nuts, or as the New Mexicans say, pinion nuts. So the Southwest peach, a little bit about its history and, um, and what was cataloged before my research took place is that uh, it's credited for the Spanish introducing it. There was a huge destruction period that occurred specifically with the Navajo tribe. Um, for efforts during the Civil War period of uh, General James Carleton trying to round up the Navajo people, um, eventually leading to the Long Walk to put the Navajo people on a reservation land um, called Bosque Redondo in New Mexico. Um, during this time, the Navajo people um, did not live in clusters like the Pueblo communities in the Southwest do. They were very uh, nomadic type living. There was a lot of raiding going on, a lot of leaders in the tribe, and um, there was not a lot of communication across, um, across the Navajo lands. So following a lot of raiding events, um, uh, Kit Carson um, began a systemic crop destruction. And a lot of the crop destruction took place in Canyon de Chez as that was, that's known as the breadbasket of the Navajo nation. Uh, specifically. And a part of that systemic crop destruction was um, orchard destruction. And a lot of the orchards that were established in Canyon de Chez were peach orchards. 
So a lot of a lot of what is known to have existed prior to all of this destruction was was then destroyed um, and had to be rebuilt um, upon return of the Navajo people after the long walk. So the history of what was known for the Navajo people and what's been uh, documented prior to my research was that the peaches are all seed propagated. They're not grafted um, as modern cultivation practices um, are with fruit crops. Um, they are multi-stem uh, growth habits. So they grow more like a shrub. And so if we go back to this screen, um, this slide, you'll kind of see that growth habit there in an old picture that was taken from Kenyon Del Morto. Um, there wasn't any pruning except for removal of dead branches for the peaches. And that that is, we'll kind of get into a little bit of why that is. The fruit is very small. I actually have some here with me today. Let me go ahead and grab one. Um, this is this is the peach that um, I grew from some of the trees that I um, have propagated. A majority of them, uh, if you propagate these, a majority of them will be, come out white flesh, but there are some yellow fleshed uh, freestone peaches. And then um, the traditional uses of how they would cook them or eat them, there's eaten ripe, fresh, um, they would boil them unripe, uh, or they would be sun dried. That's how they were preserved. And then um, after they were dried, they'd be stored and then rehydrated after um, in the winter or they were used in uh, medicinal ways by medicine men. And then it was also used as an important trade good. So these are uh, the way that uh, the common terms of how peaches are named in the traditional language. So for Navajo, it's uh, Didetso, Hopi, it's Sipala, and then for Zuni, it's Mochiqua. Some of the work that I did, I did um, oral history cataloging uh, for the peaches. So importance and uses to um, three tribes in the Southwest, Navajo, Hopi, and Zuni. And then, um, and then we did some other studies, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit. So um, these are the questions that I asked uh, tribal elders in each of those three uh, communities that I mentioned. And um, just to kind of get a little bit of foundation for the scientific studies that we were going to carry out with the, with the crop, and then also to catalog that oral history to preserve it. Um, and a lot of the reason why we did that is the, the original peach production in these tribal nations here in the Southwest is now known to be um, less than 2% of what it originally was. The oral histories, um, these are the questions, I'm sorry. So our objectives, I kind of skipped ahead. Our objectives were to gather oral histories. We wanted to relate these peaches to modern cultivars and see where their genetics lined up with the peach genome. And then we also wanted to characterize uh, the fruit for um, to compare traditional growing practices to modern growing practices. And then uh, wanted to use the de uh, dendrochronology from deceased um, tree remains to uh, see if we could understand the management practices that were taking place. Um, the questions that we asked were to identify uh, traditional management practices. Um, we wanted to understand if there were any cultural traditions associated with the peaches to define their importance to Native American communities. Uh, we wanted to also look at uh, how the seed was received by the people, if there were any stories that catalog that, that have been passed down over time. And then we also wanted to um, understand where the peaches were originally growing uh, on the reservation before the decline of, of the crop production was occurring. So with management, um, I found one occurrence of grafting actually taking place and, and these trees can be grafted but um, it's not, it wasn't uh, readily done. And so there was only one account of it being done in Zuni uh, where it was actually not bud grafted, but a whole uh, branch and root system was actually cut away from the main tree and then replanted. Very interesting. Um, and I don't even know if that is a practice that I would, I would be uh, positively confident enough to, to do myself. Um, a lot of the trees that were planted or have been planted, a lot of the elders did not plant them from seeds. So they've been growing in existence even before these elders um, were alive. 
Um, the only instance that I found one of the elders saying that they would take a new seed and plant it to get new trees was um, one of the elders in Canyon de Chez. Um, and then, and I, and I think that's probably because um, of the destruction that had happened there. Just kind of looking back that that was, um, it's kind of a, a regeneration or kind of taking back a lot of the history that had occurred in that canyon and making sure that that seed was preserved by those elders. So they, they continue to replant them. Um, but a majority of them um, uh, would mound up soil to regenerate uh, new suckering um, or new branches to, to regenerate the tree. So we really don't know how old the trees are. Um, and then there's also instances of, of elders saying that these seeds actually grow voluntarily out of canyon rocks. And so that's kind of an indication that they could potentially be a wild strain um, or well adapted to the southwest areas. Pruning um, it is culturally, um, uh, culturally respected to not prune off any live uh, plants because you're nipping life in the bud. And um, as I mentioned before, they encouraged the root suckering to regenerate the trees. They only pruned out the, the dead wood. Irrigation practices is uh, very minimal, if any, uh, for the Zuni community. It was not done. So this is an orchard in the Zuni community. Um, they, have a, they have orchard lookout houses, and it was also a protected site uh, for retreating for the, the Zuni people in case there were invaders coming into the community. Um, so these these are uh, what we would call like mesa shelves. So the valley is actually way down. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, at the top of this picture, there's actually the Zuni Valley and the village is down in that valley. And then we have this uh, about a hundred foot um, mesa shelf next to this flat um, this flat uh, plain area along the shelf where the peaches were grown. And then these additional red arrows that came up, these are the remainder of the trees that were planted in this orchard that were still alive. Um, and then irrigation, these were not irrigated as far as in Zuni, but they would receive runoff from the mesa shelves. As far as Canyon de Chez, um, the peaches would tap into the water table down below in the canyon. And so they, but they would not be irrigated except for um, the young trees being irrigated in the early years of life just to get the trees established. And then after that, they weren't irrigated. Um, same thing um, in Hopi, uh, no irrigation. Hopi would occasionally irrigate. That's what the elders had stated um, when I interviewed them. So this is just a picture of the, the pathway going down into that orchard space. Very, very isolated, very rural. Um, only one entrance in. There was another orchard there in Zuni that um, had a rope or a log that you even needed to climb to get into the orchard. Harvest, um, uh, traditionally, the, they're sun-dried um, on the sandstone shelves where they're grown and then um, stored for winter, modern practices, they use screens. Um, traditional food dishes, I, I accredited a few more during the interviews. They would be rehydrated in stews. They would be turned into cobblers with traditional um, breads. Uh, they'd be made into a peach sauce spread. And then also they were made with corn cake. <laughs> and then um, stories about how these, um, these trees were were given to the people or um, stories about where they originated from in Hopi. There's a lot of, um, a lot of accreditation to the Spanish bringing the peaches in, um, but they do have a ceremony that's done in the springtime. Uh, and it's, it's the duration of that ceremony is timed around the peach blossom period. So once the peaches bloom, they start their spring dances. And then once the peaches end their spring dances um, uh, finish. In Zuni, um, the elders that I interviewed um, say they don't know where the peaches have come from, but they know they've been around for a long time. There is a religious shrine at the peach orchard that I had showed you um, in the previous slide, um, accredited to the peaches and, and peach prayers specific for the peach orchards. And then, um, and then there was one elder, their home is in the main Zuni village, but it was being renovated and they found this, um, this pathway entrance door that 
the the contractors had gone down in and it was uh, all of the old adobe pueblos and you know pueblos how they have the honeycomb building um, structures one above another and so this or this house that is lived in today has another level below it underground that they went into and they found some dried peaches there they did not do any archaeological um, reporting on that they wanted to keep it hidden and preserved so it's it's only found in memory and cataloged in the interview that I have that I've collected for Navajo there's three accounts of um, individuals saying that they've seen peach seeds in like pots um, in Anasazi ruins, but um, no archeological evidence have, has been done. Um, and it is also a sacred seed to the Navajo and is accredited as being one of the first seeds with the corn um, being given to the people. So very significant um, history with, with the Native American tribes, um, not just in these three tribes, but throughout all of the tribes in the Southwest, um, peaches have been known to be uh, productive in their areas for long periods of time. So now we're gonna get into um, where I collected seeds from. All of these areas circled on the map are where we've collected from or our locations where peaches have been grown. So Shanto in Arizona and Farmington, New Mexico have had peaches growing there, um, but Shanto, all of the trees are now deceased. In Farmington, New Mexico, there was one source, but I, I lost that lead and couldn't find it again. Um, we, in order to do the genetics on this and to understand um, what type of uh, peach strain we are, we are handling and getting to know is um, we germinated the seed, had to freeze dry the leaves to be able to pull out the, um, the um, genetic um, strands. And then uh, we worked with Clemson University to do that and then also analyze the data. So these are um, the first set of peach seedlings that I propagated. Um, these are a picture of the peaches um, collected from Navajo Mountain. We split the pit in half to, um, or split the seed in half to get the pit out. Um, they're very small peaches, as you can see. Um, and then I just have here a picture of one of the, the seedlings that we grew out. Um, very long taproot, very healthy seedling there, um, just to get the trees that we had. So some of the results with the genetics that we did is um, we compared them to 20 modern accessions just for time of me being able to finish up my thesis. We're going to eventually compare them to the full genome. And we've uh, recently published an article on the genetics for the peaches. Um, as you can see, um, we don't have very close relation. The, the upper half of this cleidogram are all of the accessions that grouped very well together. Um, because they have had a lot of um, outcrossing or breeding done with them. And these are modern peach cultivars or uh, peach cultivars from, from Asia, Syria, Spain, Brazil, Mexico, and then throughout the U.S. of all of the breeding, the foundation of the U.S. Uh, peach, peach breeds that have been produced. And then down below, we have uh, the seeds that I collected and propagated and they divide um, regionally amongst each other. So their, uh, their relation and how well um, they, they group together um, shows that these, these seeds have been heavily inbred so much that they do not compare to modern accession uh, breeds. And um, these blue arrows here that have just shown up on your, on your uh, screen are um, seed selections that I gathered from Hopi. And if you've ever been into the Hopi area, there's a lot of modern, um, modern peach cultivars being interplanted in with the original peaches that they've had growing. So there is outcrossing that's occurring in the Hopi community. But as far as these other um, locations and some select orchards in Hopi, there is no outcrossing occurring. Um, so with fruit collection, we collected fruit from an orchard in Navajo Mountain, and then also from the peaches that I've grown. And so this uh, lower picture is an or orchard where I have the peaches that I've propagated. Um, we've planted them out in an orchard in Thatcher, Utah. And, um, and so I harvest fruit from there and, are, and I'm collecting data from them um, on a managed perspective. And then we collected fruit from Navajo Mountain to look at uh, traditional um, management practices. We did a um, FDA uh, food nutritional analysis. And so we have here um, one of the peaches from Navajo Mountain um, that we've collected. We did, we did the, the analysis with that peach and then we compared it to the um, standard 
nutritional food label for the USDA um, yellow peaches. And what we found is that uh, the Navajo Mountain fruit, even grown in traditional uh, management practices, they have higher calories, higher calcium, higher fiber, carbohydrate content, and higher total fat. Um, they're lower in protein and fatty acids. Um, and then there's no difference in total minerals or total sugars. We also did a drought tolerance study um, looking and comparing to a seedling rootstock uh, called Lovell. And we found that uh, the Navajo takes up more water when water is available. So their, their transpiration rate was a lot higher than the level seedling. And then um, we dried them down over a period of days to, um, to their permanent, almost to their permanent wilting point. And um, they would, the, the Navajo peaches would take up less water than the level, but then they also recovered at a faster rate. So you can kind of, you can see that in this, um, in this figure here that they do indicate that they are potentially more drought tolerant. With the dendrochronology study that we did, um, we took uh, cross sections from dead orchard trees, as I mentioned. We had a couple of live cores, but we were not able to cross date them. Um, one, we didn't have enough rings, we didn't have enough samples to do so as well. Um, so we uh, we counted the rings and then we recorded the ring widths in all the samples that we collected. Um, you can see the devastation of some of the orchards, how what is left of them and, and the material that we had to work with. And what we found is that the trees, um, just one branch, and, and as you saw, they're multi-stem growing habit. Um, so we don't know really how old a tree would be. And then with the, re, uh, the suckering that we had, um, we, again, we don't know how old the tree is, but this was one picture in time, one branch on the multi-stem uh, growing habit. Um, and we averaged over the areas that we were uh, collecting from, they can live for a very long time, um, 70 to 80 years. And then with the weathering that we had, um, a lot of the years we could estimate 10 to 20 years are actually removed just off of the weathering that we had. So we're looking at trees that are 80 to 100 years in reality at with one branch. And, um, and then we uh, were able to indicate and look at the irrigation practices and it matched up very well with what the elders were saying how they would irrigate. So as you can see Zuni, um, very, very little variability. Um, the ring width uh, basal area index increment or basal area um, increment was uh, very small and vice versa to um, the other locations. So in Navajo Mountain, when we go there, um, their trees are able to tap into a water table and then they do get assisted irrigation here and there. But so there is a lot more um, variability in that in the growth increment. So in conclusion, um, and the reason why I bring up this crop for um, Swain is because this could be considered as uh, grown in conjunction with other field crops for that agroforestation um, practice. Um, they are uh, very sacred to the tribal people, um, but it is a very nutritious food source and um, has a lot, of, uh, a lot of potential with it as far as drought tolerance. It could be used as a, as a drought tolerant rootstock, could be grown um, intermingling with those, uh, with other crops as well. Um, and then um, with its uh, specific isolated genetic strain, we wanna be able to keep it isolated. And then they, uh, they can also live for a long period of time and are still productive. The orchards that are still living today are still very productive today as well. Um, and then, um, very interesting. I did also find missing rings. Um, I have that included here on the conclusion. So we really don't know how old these trees are. Um, they're very um, historic to the people. Um, one thing that we want to do, and it's a privilege to be able to present here for uh, Swan because we want to look for um, additional locations to collaborate with because we want to do uh, additional uh, phenological and physiological characterization with these peaches um, to benefit not only Native American people, but also to uh, benefit the, the fruit um, breeding programs. This could potentially yield to a, a rootstock, a drought tolerant rootstock for peach producers. Um, and it could 
um, we're also looking to just preserve it, um, finding locations to have in isolation to produce seed, provide a seed bank for uh, Native Americans that want to uh, continue growing this sacred and uh, beneficial food source. So just some acknowledgements here. We have a lot of funders that um, supported this research, um, a lot of tribal communities that also supported um, this research, and then also um, uh, scholars and family that support, supported this research. Are there any questions? Um, Reagan, there was one question from uh, Stephen Price. Are there examples of seed fruit stored in museums that could be used for genetic comparison to the modern trees, perhaps to look at genetic drift over time? Um, so interesting enough, I did look into that and I do have a slide here. Let me go um, a little bit. This is a little bit more data than I wanted to get into, um, but we do have this here. Funny enough, I was so interested in that because I went back into Spanish records and was like, you know, this does not line up with Native American stories as far as how the pathway was traded and then how they um, are accrediting Spanish for trading. So if Spanish were to trade, um, seeds and Native Americans taking it and trading it, it would have gone up the Rio Grande. But Hopi stories say we had the peaches first, we spread it to all of our sister Pueblo tribes, and so it would have spread from Arizona all the way across um, and not up the Rio Grande. And so very interesting. We looked at that. Um, obviously, we can't do a lot of cross comparison, but these are some of the samples that, um, that Molly Toll, who is a um, Ethno archaeo archaeoethnobotanist, as I believe her term, um, and we we kind of saw some indication that um, we don't know obviously management production or management practices in these areas, um, but the seeds are a little bit um, smaller. I think we hold on. Let me just sorry. Um, so we we kind of we did a length, width, and thickness of the seeds. And then, um, oh, sorry. Um, and then we, some of the seeds that I collected are in this uh, lower graph down here. And you can kind of see um, with the level, the level is a little bit larger um, than some of the other treatments that we had. So these seeds were here from Hopi. Um, they're very small pits with the management practices. These seeds are from Kenya de Shea. Um, and then these seeds are from Navajo Mountain. There was, it was, it was kind of hard to pick anything out, um, but cross comparison, the level were, um, were much larger in size and thickness than um, the seeds that we were gathering from these, from these strains. Thanks, Reagan. And there are quite a number of questions that are being generated in the chat. Um, so what I would ask is that we then we can move on to our next presenter to stay on schedule. And if you could run through that chat um, and see what questions you can answer there. And um, if, if some of the questions are more evolved and in depth, you want to put that in a separate document that I could load up with the program as well. Um, be happy to do that. I sure can, thank you so much. Okay, and with that, um, let's go into our next presenter. Okay, okay um, Dr. Sun, you'll need to unmute. All right, uh, thank you so much for uh, this uh, nice opportunity to uh, share some of the research we are doing uh, with uh, Pinion Pond. You know, this project actually uh, you know, collaborated with, uh, you know, different people at Utah State University, uh, Regan, uh, she, she already uh, presented a nice uh, uh, species uh, you know, on Navajo peach. And Dr. Ryan Stewart from uh, BYU and Ben Scholar, he actually uh, an assistant professor in Washington County. Uh, he's working on, uh, uh, I think it's agriculture and the natural resources. And Mark Rani is uh, uh, owner of the South Shore Farm. Uh, he's helping us to establish a, a trial there actually. Uh, PJ uh, Abraham from uh, Utah Division of Forest. 
um, <clears throat> is also helping us find a place to uh, grow some uh, plants uh, in uh, Duchenne County. You know, we got a uh, funding uh, from USU uh, Extension uh, Grant Program to do this kind of work. So uh, just a little bit of uh, introduction about uh, pine nut production. Uh, right now, there are uh, five major uh, producers uh, in this world, like China, Russia, Afghanistan, Korea, and Pakistan. You know, in 2015, actually, we see uh, there are almost 20,000 metrical tons of pine nuts produced in this world. And two years later, in uh, 2017, there are about a uh, 20% increase. And you know, those pine nuts produced from seven different uh, uh, pine species. And I have actually have um, a picture show here. And uh, the one uh, is Pinus pioneer is from Europe. And then uh, this uh, Pinus uh, are Mandir, and this is the uh, Panas Koreanesis. Most of them are uh, Eastern Asian uh, countries like uh, Korea and China. And this one is actually a um, Panas uh, Joradiana is from India and uh, pa uh, Pakistan. So um, actually the uh, US is the big uh, importer, you know, 20 23% of the Panas produced in this world, you know, actually, you know, uh, uh, came to US. In the market, you can see uh, they sell about uh, forty dollars per pound, and uh, for unshared nuts, at least twenty pounds at this time. <clears throat> Doctor Sun, yes. Doctor Sun, we're being asked if you could um, show your other monitor. Right now, what we're seeing is the back end of the slideshow instead of the main slideshow. Is this better? Yes. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you so much uh, for this. You know, uh, as I mentioned, you know, about eighty percent of the uh, pine nuts actually exported, uh, uh, imported from other countries in the U.S., and the rest of uh, twenty percent actually are harvested from the uh, uh, wider population, and you know, from these uh, two species, uh, pine nuts elgulis and pine nuts molophena. And however, this practice is uh, experienced. Uh, there's so much challenges at this time uh, due to a very drought condition and also wildfire. Mm. You know, the picture I showed here, this is the picture, and uh, you know, about uh, 100 million trees died in, uh, in California uh, in uh, 2015. And recently I saw this news uh, in uh, St. George News, uh, uh, how many valley I got some, uh, uh, wildfire. Actually, uh, this place we actually identified three uh, high yielding uh, sessions of the uh, uh, panels and uh, molophena. So that's uh, the situation we have right now. And much efforts, you know, has uh, you know have been uh, spent to remove pinions and junipers so that we in, in, uh, we can enhance grazing and the watershed quality. So that's another challenge. You know, last year. Uh, Utah actually passed uh, a regional water conservation goal. We are expected to uh, reduce water use 35% uh, by 2050. So I will expect this uh, will affect a lot of orchards in this uh, in the state. You know, some of them are using uh, the land for producing, you know, sweet cherry or peach, and those are high water use plants. So those land probably will be abandoned. And I think, uh, you know, planted some uh, um, pine nut tree uh, probably is the best way to do it. So, um, in terms of the two uh, species, the first one is the Panos uh, air junis. Uh, it's a double little opinion pine. It's native in to, uh, to, to the Intermountain West. And there are about five million acres of plants in the wild. It's a small tree and about uh, they can grow uh, 20 feet tall, uh, usually mixed with the uh, junipers. Uh, you know, the comb, they can produce combs, uh, you know, from uh, 25 years uh, until 100 years. So it's pretty long, uh, uh, long uh, producing time. Seed comb usually take about three years to mature. And the area three to seven years, they will experience uh, some masting events, uh, which is uh, the no yielding uh, uh, yield. 
Uh, nuts are pretty uh, nutritious, 14% uh, protein, 62% uh, fats, and 18% carbohydrates. The second species is the Panus uh, monophena. Uh, it's a single little pinion pan native to the Great Basin. There are about uh, 17 uh, million echoes in that world. So it's a uh, slow growing carnivores and uh, like other species, they can grow uh, 40 feet tall and usually grow with uh, Utah juniper and the Rocky Mountain juniper. They produce cones between uh, 35 to 100 years. Uh, so it's pretty long and seed comb usually takes two uh, years to mature. And of course, every uh, three to five years, they will have mast events. The nuts produced from this uh, species are also nutritious and you know, at 10% uh, protein, 23% fats, which is much lower compared to a uh, panus algeris. And this one has uh, about 54% of uh, carbohydrates. And uh, if you look at this picture, you know, the pandas produced this from these two trees, you know, are probably uh, pretty significant larger than those uh, imported ones. And for pandas monophenol, you know, the, the, the nuts produced actually, uh, you know, much larger than the uh, pandas algenes. That's why we wanted to uh, try to uh, use uh, pandas monophenol, you know, for our pandas production in this project. So probably you will see, oh, maybe we just plant some seedlings in the, in the land and then we can uh, grow at this uh, for pan nut production. However, it takes so much time. And uh, that's uh, as well, you know, grafting can just uh, to uh, produce trees uh, which, is, uh, which are much uh, you know, faster uh, to mature. So there actually, uh, there's one case, you know, shared by Dave Temper. You know, he grafted the Panus monophena on Panus adjunis uh, rootstock. You know, those trees produce combs in eight to 10 years. You know, no sugar condition with mulch and irrigation once a week is much uh, faster compared to uh, those plants from seedlings. So uh, that's give a nice, uh, you know, clue to our project and, <clears throat> And as Rick mentioned that Dr. Larry Rope and his graduate students and did a lot of work in the past. You know, he always talked to me about that. If you are a junior professor, you, know, you cannot attack this project because it's too dangerous for your promotion. So, um, but with his sole you know, research in the past, I'm brave enough to take over the, the research. Actually, what he did, and uh, he did their uh, own research, is a top working mature uh, two little pinion band uh, with the uh, single little pinion band. So uh, he did this in 2017 and 2018. Uh, he tried in you know, a bug graft and start wedge graft here and start stop graft. Mm, what he did is, you know, after grafted those. Uh, uh, a session the scion, he put a wax and then, you know, on this graft union, he put a plastic to keep this uh, in a high humidity uh, to reduce the uh, transpiration. On the top of this um, um, plastic, uh, he put some, uh, you know, a white plastic to uh, reduce the uh, heat accumulation. You know, from the research he did actually found the salt wedge uh, is pretty significant, you know, for successfully uh, grafting uh, these uh, two uh, uh, pinions together. And the uh, paper actually uh, has been accepted by Native Plants Journal. Uh, so if you are interested in the future, yeah, you may download from there. He also tried the, another project is uh, try to identify a uh, high yielding, uh, you know, pinion pine from uh, the natural. So he went the uh, you know three locations in Utah and the one location in Nevada. You know what he did is uh, he uh, connect the branches and you know using a cone scale counting uh, technique to uh, to estimate how much a cone produced in uh, you know ten years before actually. 
And from that uh, method, he identified the three assertions from each location. And then he used that uh, plans as a sign on wood uh, uh, material and the grafted to uh, you know, double little pinning pan seedlings uh, using the uh, side of vinyl, side of which uh, grafting uh, method. And from that research actually, uh, you know, a very good protocol developed by him, you know, with the, uh, the sort of veneer and the sort of wage grafting, and they got uh, about 90, almost 90% success rate on this. It's a pretty significant results actually. And this paper also accepted by the uh, Native Plants Journal. In uh, 2019, I uh, actually joined, with, uh, joined him uh, to uh, plant those trees in, uh, in our rich mound. So we built the orchard there with uh, 196 plants. And uh, those trees planted in, um, you know, uh, 15 uh, feet between them and then uh, 20 feet uh, between the rows. And this is the second year growth already. We just keep them uh, maintain, water them uh, 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 two, uh, twice a week uh, this year. Last year, we actually watered them uh, once a week for them to establish. And so in the, as uh, he retired this, uh, past December and the guy to uh, just uh, take over this uh, orchard and to uh, maintain, hopefully in the next 10 years, we can have some, some plans to uh, produce corn. So why am I doing that? I'm thinking, oh, if we can establish more orchards in Utah, then you know, we can uh, test all those uh, uh, high yielding sessions to see uh, how they responded to a different environment and also soil type. So I developed, developed a proposal to a Utah Extension uh, grant program and I tried to establish uh, three orchards, uh, one in Duchesne County and the other one in uh, UF County and Washington County. And this year, Dr. Ryan Stewart actually uh, took the lead and uh, uh, write another proposal to uh, uh, Utah Department of Egg and Food and we got this grant and try to identify high yielding uh, panels algunis for color area because this region is more uh, interested in growing native uh, pinion pan there. So uh, in the future, we probably, we probably, we probably uh, established another, uh, another orchard there. So, uh, you know, I started doing this project this year, uh, this uh, February, we went to uh, uh, Raft River, uh, one location uh, we had, uh, Dr. Rapp identified three uh, high yielding sessions there. We went there to collect cyan wood. And uh, when we got these uh, branches from the top of canopy of the trees, we sorted them out and put them in bundle and then wrap them with a, a wet paper towel and store them in the cooler. And this is how we uh, process the, uh, the uh, scion. Yeah, three trees we, are, uh, we collected is, the first one is a B, we call it BUT1. It's about a 60 years old tree and 17 feet tall. The crown spread is about 21 feet. And, BUT3 is, uh, is another tree, it's a beautiful shape here, as you see on the picture, it's about 60 years old, uh, 22 feet tall, and that's crown spread about 21 feet. This is the third tree we, uh, we, we connected, it's BUT4, it's about 55 years at this time. And 19 feet high, about 20, uh, feet of uh, crowns spread. So in March, uh, in February uh, to March, uh, we did the grafting and we got a bunch of students. Uh, you know, some of them are just the first time to doing that. Even myself is first time. So yeah, however, you can see, uh, uh, we learned a lot of stuff uh, from Dr. Rob. And <clears throat> this is what we prepared the root stock. And we first will make a, uh, and just uh, one shallow cut uh, into the wood. Of course, before when you do this, uh, make sure 
to uh, clean in that leaders so that you can have a room to, uh, to work on that. Uh, this is the card we made. Uh, it's about one inch, one and a half inch uh, long. And that's just show you how to prepare the scion. You know, usually we just make uh, two cards on both sides of the scion uh, to make a V shape uh, so that the V shape can match the card in the root stock. And for the scion, you know, we usually keep five to uh, 10 needles. Uh, it's about one and one half inch long. So after the scion uh, inserted into the root stock, and we uh, use rubber band to tie them to have a good uh, camping and the camping contact. And then we wrap them with um, you know, parafilm to uh, prevent the desiccation. So afterwards, we put all the grafted plants you know, under plastic and the shade cloth uh, to uh, reduce the transpiration and also help uh, yeah, reducing uh, reduce uh, uh, heat accumulation. You know, once a week, we remove both of them to let the plants breathe a little bit uh, so that uh, no condensation and no disease problems uh, uh, for those plants. You know, um, six weeks later, actually, you know, on, in April, we move uh, plastic uh, cover and we remove the shade cloth and then another two weeks, we remove the apical bars because we wanted to re reduce the uh, apical dominance. So the scion can be, uh, you know, forced out. And then uh, in July, actually, we uh, cut the top part of the root stock, you know, just one centimeter above the grafting unit. And this is actually what the plants looks like at this time. And we counted how many. Uh, uh, grafting successful and actually uh, not uh, too bad. So, uh, Seventy percent of grafting, uh, considering you know we got a bunch of students, uh, you know even myself, uh, the first time to doing that. Seventy percent is actually uh, you know very good of, uh, rate. They do have some uh, variations among different sessions. You know for BOT three we only get a fifty three percent, and BOT four we got uh, almost uh, eighty two percent. So with this project, actually, we produced a, a, a video on this. Uh, you know, the uh, undergraduate students help us uh, to uh, get this done. It's a nice uh, job. Uh, so I would like to just, just uh, uh, let you to watch this video. And also, it's available on YouTube if uh, you're, you're interested in that. So make sure they're compatible each other since both of them are pinnings. So the compatible is not a big issue. And we're using single needle pinning panel as a scion, double needle pinning panel as a root stock. And make sure you're doing that in a good stage. That's why we did it in spring. This is how we collect the scion and put them in a cold storage. The median we use is pretty uh, well drainaged, you know, with uh, half a night. The scion is the newest growth and make sure they have five to 10 needles. And, and this is the Dr. Ruff who prepare a scion for grafting. So make sure you uh, sanitize your tools before you do any cuts. Yeah, just put in some of the branches off and make a room for grafting.
make a long smooth cut through the stem. And when you do this, to make sure it can be in contact, otherwise the graft will not take in. And then use the rubber band to tie that to help with camping, camping contact. Yeah, it takes uh, some practice to tie these things. Then we use a parafilm to pre uh, prevent the desiccation. always good practice to level them. You now for our research, we have to do that. Some of the proper after peel, we keep them water uh, very good and keep the humidity high. And the grafting uh, powder with plastic or shade cloth to, uh, to reduce transpiration or uh, heat accumulation. So this is how to uh, break the apical dominance. And then just to remove the top part of the root stalk, so the scion can uh, uh, sprout and grow as a new plant. So this is the uh, the video we made on this project. And why we're doing that, I think, you know, we always uh, con uh, constrained by the time uh, for this grafting. So I tried to summer, gra uh, summer grafting uh, this summer because we have, uh, we had some uh, scion woods uh, connected and they're kept in the uh, cold storage. Uh, however, I didn't do any treatment on these. So as you see that, uh, and there's so much mold for some of the uh, uh, scion. Uh, you know, fortunately, we can uh, identify some good, uh, good uh, scion wood and use that for um, summer, uh, summer grafting. And this is what we did. We put those plants in the, uh, in the greenhouse condition and they put a shade cloth on the top of this canopy. And the grafting unit actually uh, just, uh, you know, covered with plastic. And you know, seven weeks after grafting, we actually found a five of them. You know, out of twenty grafts we did, uh, it's pretty good. And the rest of them just died because of the mold. So uh, from that uh, uh, trial, we think uh, you know, summer grafting is still possible if we can uh, have a dormant uh, uh, sunshine wood available. Yeah, we can still grafting on this. So this is some of the uh, uh, you know, conclusions and the future direction. You know, of course, from the trial we did, uh, sideways grafting can uh, have a 70% success uh, in grafting. And yeah, I think we can improve that to uh, have a more uh, success rate in the future. And summer grafting is possible if we can uh, have uh, a good uh, dormant mode free sign wood. So probably we did try some practice to see if we can store these uh, sangon woods, uh, you know, for longer period. And we're going to actually try uh, for grafting in three weeks. And we will go there again to collect uh, dormant current season uh, sangon woods uh, from those uh, uh, sessions and try for grafting, see if we can uh, do that, uh, you know, in the fall. And next year, you know, I just ordered the 650 plants, so more grafting will come yeah, next year.
And if we got all the grafted plants, we will transplant it into uh, three locations in Utah. Yeah, hopefully in April or maybe in uh, October. So this is about the presentation I would like to share with you as uh, a still ongoing project. So uh, a lot of uh, new things to know. So uh, at this time, I would like to uh, take any questions uh, if you have. Thank you. Dr. Sun, there was a question about, is there a difference in ease of de-hulling um, between the two different uh, species? Um, can both be de-hulled commercially? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, actually, uh, the, the other project, we just got a funding uh, on that. We're actually going to try that, actually. Okay. Um, and would the ungrafted trees also produce a younger age with mulch and irrigation? So the, what, a kind of, what a kind of young trees, uh, uh, you know, from, from seedlings? Um, Mark, would you like to, to clarify your question? Okay. All right, so you know, if, if they're from seedlings, they will take a longer time to, uh, to uh, grow to this stage. However, if- uh, Yeah, he, uh, he said from seedlings, yes. Oh, from seedlings, they will take uh, much longer. Like those plants in the wild, they take about 25 years for uh, uh, Panos agonis and 35 years for the Panos monophenol to uh, start to produce uh, cones. It, it will be taken longer. And that's why we use grafting and to, uh, to, uh, sub, to uh, speed this process. Okay. Yeah. All right, and I think that's the bulk of our questions. So let me turn it back over to Jim to kind of put a bow on this experience and then we'll move into our, um, the rest of our agenda. Okay, thank you, Bev. And thank you very much, Yuping and Reagan. I know Reagan just had to leave, but I really, really appreciate both presentations. Uh, to me, it was personally fascinating, but these, these are two species that I think have a lot of potential in agroforestry systems. And it, it was really kind of fascinating to learn about both the sort of cultural um, accessions and the uh, traditional, uses of the peaches and also the modern work mm -hmm. that both of you are doing, but the kind of work you're doing, you paying to maybe increase the productivity and the marketability of pinot nuts is, is just really fascinating. And I hope down the line, we'll start to see both pinot nuts and peaches marketed more locally from these, from these sources. Uh, like at farmer's markets, local grocery stores. I think they just really, really fit well with sort of ideals of local food production, culturally important food production, et cetera. And I also wanna thank the audience. And, and I don't know all of you, but I know quite a few of you. And it was really nice to see the diversity. I mean, we have people from the National Institutes of Food and Agriculture, from the USDA National Agroforestry Center, from various universities, both uh, faculty and extension personnel uh, from those institutions. We have some teachers. Uh, we, we have state agency folks, a pretty good number of forestry community folks. And just a really nice mix here today to listen to these uh, two presentations. There were some really good questions and uh, some of them have been answered already. I think in both cases, these speakers would welcome the opportunity to, re to have direct connections, you know, if you were to email them. I know in the chat, Reagan provided her email and we can get yours as well, you ping, and uh, make sure that that's available to people. Maybe you could type it in if you don't mind. Um, so I, I really enjoyed this pres these presentations. I think they fit really well with, where we're wanting to head with agroforestry in the Southwest using both native species and um, introduced species that have potential and cultural importance. So 
unless there's any further questions, I think we're done with the webinar part of, of the, today. I do encourage anyone who's interested in SWAN, who's not already a member, not engaged with us, uh, to consider sticking around. We'll, we'll take a short break and then we're gonna reconvene and uh, start our business meeting for this, for this organization. So I suggest, let's see, it's about 10.06 according to my computer. Let's just take like a five minute break and then we'll reconvene for those who are interested in the SWAN business presentation. So okay. thank, you all. thank you all for your participation. That sounds great. Thanks, Jim. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. It will be posted to the SWAN site and we are gonna provide a full list of the chat and responses. Reagan had to leave and she's gonna finish making those responses and we'll add that document alongside our posting on the SWAN site. So, all right, back in five. Alrighty. <laughs>